God bless you everyone. My name is David Ewan and I head up the Brave Hearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Meli Martinez. Welcome. Uh, today we're going to be talking about spiritual house cleaning. Say to yourself, spiritual house cleaning. So the topic of discussions related to our topic, spiritual house cleaning, is what ministers do. Wouldn't you like to know that? What do ministers do? Then we'll talk about the organization of a church. Well, a, the ministers are part of a church. Let's see how a church is organized according to the Bible. Mm -hmm. Then we'll have an understanding of 1 Timothy chapter 3. That's where our basis of our conversation will be today. And then we'll talk about responsibilities and disciplines. That's a good set of words, responsibilities and disciplines. And then the next one, we're going to shake up the cage a little bit by talking about how we know false ministers. Say false ministers to yourself. Now we're going to talk about character and integrity. This is how we discern where the false ministers are and who they are. Then we'll talk about being big and fat. And yes, that's nuts. Yes, that's right. We're going to be talking about being big and fat. And we'll wrap things up by talking about being a disciple. Some of the things that I'll be talking about use acronyms for the purposes of remembering. And we'll be covering more about that in a little bit. But first, let's talk about what being a Christian means. See, we become a Christian by the work of the Holy Spirit. Say Holy Spirit, yes. It's all driven by the Holy Spirit because 2,000 years ago, that was the gift given to us by Jesus. But our maturity in Christ and how we practice our faith is determined by the choices, the choices we make from the conviction and covenants of our beliefs. That means if we have strong belief in Christ, then our choices will be better because we're following Christ. If we have a small amount or little amount of belief, then our choices will be less wise. So we choose to take the faith that God gives and makes it more real and effective. We choose to make the right choices or not, See, we can choose to not make the right choices. So we have no excuse when our life is messed up by neglect or poor choices. It's all related to ignorance. So the Bible calls us to a higher level of excellence than, that, than those of others around us. One of truth, love, honesty, and functionality. Functionality relates to our behavior. This is integrity in action. That's what functionality is. It is the implementation of God's ways in the practice of our daily Christian lives. We are adhering to God's rules, his rules, morals, teachings, and principles. See, if we have little faith in Christ, then we will not be adhering to his rules, morals, teachings, and principles. And that's where we fail. And that's the problem within our spiritual lives. We are limited in our faith. So we're going to do a little spiritual house cleaning today. Ministers of the church are held accountable for their character, their integrity, their actions, and the words out of their mouth. That's what we're talking about today. We're going to make the correction of character, integrity, actions, and words. Now, let me go to our second topic. What do we mean by ministers? Well, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 tells us, okay? And I'll read the scripture. And again, this is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And the scripture reads, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. I'm going to read that again because that tells us the fivefold ministry. And he gave us some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. 
Now let's talk about my third topic, teachings and principles. Teachings and principles dictate a way of life. Now, where do the teachings and principles come from? They come from the Bible. Where do the teachings and prim principles get spoken to, to us? How, how do we learn about those teachings and principles? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. It's the ministers we talked about. So let's talk about what happens when we fail in the teachings and principles. This whole attitude of us and them, that causes division. What happens in division? Division causes debate. What is debate? That's conflict. What is conflict? That's confusion because there's more than one side. Confusion causes violence. Why? Because there's a fight. Violence causes ignorance. Ignorance means departed from God. Departed from God means lost. That's the idea. What's the job of the minister? It's to bring the lost back to God through the teachings and principles. That's the importance of teachings and principles. That's why people attend church. They're receiving the teachings and principles. And who are they receiving them from? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And we know that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. So it's a huge responsibility that requires a calling. Say to yourself the word calling. See, being a minister is not a job. It's a calling. It's a calling. A calling has a greater accountability. What kind of accountability? It's for the four things we talked about before. Character, which is your behavior integrity which relates to your trustworthiness the actions it's what people see it's the words that come out of your mouth it's what other people hear from you character integrity actions and words so again a calling has a greater accountability for all of these now i'm going to tell you a short story it's a true story See, when I was a little boy, I was a young kid, and my father taught me how to sweep the floor in the garage, okay? And what I was doing is I was sweeping and nothing was happening. The floor was still dirty. So he said I was relocating the problem. The key word is relocating. See, I fixed one area, but the problem was moved to another area. See, I try to clean up one area, and over there, there's the problem it still is dirty so he showed me to sweep the edges first you know the part that i would normally ignore that's normally out of my sight i sweep the edges first and bring everything into the middle he told me that the middle takes care of itself because when you see the big pile in the middle it's easy to clean up see you have just one simple pile see what he was showing me is that the edge is the most important and often ignored because people don't look to the edge they don't look to the outside see if you ignore something then you are ignorant that's what that word ignorant comes from it means you didn't know so my father asked me he asked me a very clever question it was kind of rhetorical after he asked me that same question after a while but he said or he asked me i should say what are the two ways to do a job and then he always told me the right way and the wrong way. Those are the two ways to do a job, the right way and the wrong way. See, the wrong way is through ignorance. We talked about that word, ignorance. The right way is to not relocate the problem. That's the right way, okay? So the right way puts you head on into the problem instead of ignoring it. You see, what my father was teaching me and what he's talking to me about it's very much like ministry. There are two ways, the right way and the wrong way. See, a minister must head into the problem through and not ignore the, the Holy Spirit and the teaching principles of the, of the Bible. See, the Holy Spirit and the teachings and principles of the Bible is kind of like the edge. It's off to the side. 
It's what people forget. It's what people don't want to pay attention to. Okay, so ministers need to be aware that there's the right way and the wrong way. Don't relocate the problem. Go head on into the problem and take care of satisfying the Holy Spirit and the will of the Holy Spirit by following the teachings and principles of the Bible. Okay, so let's talk about once we head into the problem and do it the right way. See, the burden of responsibility includes a personal stewardship. What do I mean by personal stewardship? That means watching your actions. It goes back to the character, which is your behavior and lifestyle, your integrity, which is your trustworthiness, your actions relating to what people see, and the words out of your mouth, that's what people hear. Now let's go to my fourth topic, topic number four, the pastoral epistles. What do we mean by epistles? I'm not talking about email, text, or WhatsApp. I'm talking about letters. Okay, um, I'll explain what I mean by epistles. See, first and second of Timothy, along with Titus, are known as the pastoral epistles. Pastoral epistles. Epistles are letters. For example, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to Timothy, a church leader, for the purposes of teaching him and instructing him. We get teaching and instruction from the Bible. We call that instruction principles. These principles we read in the Bible, okay, that's, that's um, part of the teaching. Now, because they consist largely, these, these epistles, first and second of Timothy, along with Titus, are known as the pastoral epistles, they consist largely of pastoral advice on how to deal with problems in the churches of both Ephesus and Crete. Today's conversation relates to the church of Ephesus because that's what the Apostle Paul instructed Timothy to do, was to focus on the church in Ephesus. So these three epistles have a lot in common with each other. The very interesting thing is with the first and the second, first and, se first and second Timothy, uh, you'll see the relationship of the Apostle Paul change over time. You'll see that the Apostle Paul has a greater expectation and speaks in a way that shows that Timothy has matured over time. Okay, in 1 Timothy, Paul, who has gone on to Macedonia, asked Timothy to remain in Ephesus in order to deal with the false teachers. Those are the false ministers that had arisen there. And we know that when we look at 1 of Timothy, chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. I won't read it today because in a previous presentation, we had talked about this. So 1 of Timothy, chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. Okay, now I'm going to go to my fifth topic, which is how is a church leadership organized? Okay, we've talked a little bit about ministers. Let's talk about the leadership. Okay, I'm part of the leadership team. See, here I am. Okay, in Christianity, a minister is a person authorized by the church or other religious organizations to perform functions such as teachings of beliefs, kind of like what I'm doing now, leading services such as weddings, baptisms, or funerals, or otherwise providing spiritual guidance to the community. The key point is a minister provides spiritual guidance to the community. A pastor performs one main task, one main task, caring for the people who are members of the church in the same way that a shepherd cares for sheep. So that's why we sometimes call a pastor a shepherd. A minister can be a pastor, but a minister can also be a priest, teacher, bishop, healer, evangelist, prophet, and several other things as well. So minister is more of a general term. So when I speak about minister, when you hear me say minister, I'm speaking of all kinds of ministers as you would see dictated in the fivefold ministry. Now I'm going, I've read Ephesians chapter four, verse 11 before, but now I'm going to read a little bit more. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter four, verse 11 through 13. So we get a better understanding of the responsibilities of ministers. So let's do that. And he gave some apostles 
and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Sounds like leadership development if I were to oversimplify it. <coughs> Pardon me. Now I'm going to present our feature scripture. I'll pause a bit. I just had a brief pause as I cleared my throat. I'm going to continue. We just finished reading about the fivefold ministry, which I'll read again. Uh, which was Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now I'm going to go to our fifth topic, which brings us to our feature scripture of tonight's presentation, which is 1st of Timothy uh, chapter 3. And I'll be reading from verse 3 through, uh, it'll be through verse 13. Verse 3 through 13. So 1st of Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 3 through 13. Um, so the scripture reads, Here is a trustworthy saying, Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a rec uh, recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and a great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Now, we're talking about ministers, and I'm just going to talk about some of the behaviors that that scripture, and again, I read 1st of Timothy chapter 3, verse 3 through 13, and a lot was said, and I'll just break it down for you. Um, and there's, uh, I guess, 14 different topics, uh, which I'll go very quickly. Uh, number one, a minister has to be above reproach. Do not act with expression of disapproval or disappointment. See, that causes division. The next one, faithful to his wife. No adultery, no, adultery, no unfaithfulness. Uh, temperate, that means showing moderation or self-restraint. Uh, That's a behavior self-controlled, uh, the ability to manage your actions, feelings, and emotions. That's related to your actions. It's what people see. Uh, respectable. Uh, that's regarded by society to be good, proper, or correct. So you have to be known as being respectable. Uh, hospitable, uh, friendly and welcoming to strangers or guests. So you treat everyone alike. 
uh, able to teach, able to teach, pass on knowledge to future generations, such as the gospel. Uh, the next one, not given to drunkenness. It's okay to have a drink, but do not fall into severe state of being drunk. Uh, number nine, not violent, but gentle. That relates to that outward behavior. Not quarrelsome. That means not moody or positioned into constant argument. And the next one, uh, not a lover of money. That's related to greed. It relates to financial greed and financial selfishness. Um, and the next one, he must manage his own family well. That means to be a good provider. Um, he must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall into the same judgment as the devil. And uh, the last one, he must also have good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the de uh, devil's trap. So he needs to be known that he's firm in the Christian faith. Now let's talk about the actions from the behaviors as defined in 1st of Timothy chapter three. We just talked about uh, some of these behaviors. Um, I have three points that I'll tell you about. The first point, he must preach the gospel at all times, okay? So number one, he must glorify God and not himself. Preach the word of God, surrender his will to God's will. It's not all about himself. Preach for souls and not for personal gain. So the goal is to save, uh, to save souls, not to run the church as a business and be disciplined and accountable for your actions, your behaviors, and everything that comes out of your mouth. The second point, point number two, he must be a servant to all people. So he must serve with a sense of obligation. He must serve with compassion. He must be versatile and growing in his skills, be very talented in serving the will of God and to serve with God's priorities, not his own priorities. Now, let me go to the third point, the third point. He must be disciplined in all situations. He must serve with judgment in view. He must serve with the scriptures in view, and he must serve with others in view, not himself, okay? Now, we've talked a little bit about the ministers. Now, I'm gonna to go to my eighth topic, which is the responsibilities of the church body. So the church body must do three things, three things, receive, submit, follow. I'll say that again, receive, submit, and follow. So what do I mean by that? They must, number one, receive the word and obey it. That means that that's discovered, I should say, in James chapter one, verse 22 through 25. Uh, the next one, item number two, submit to his leadership. That means God's leadership. That's in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and 17. And number three, follow his Christ-like example. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. So again, that's receive, submit, and follow. You see, the Apostle Paul provided extensive theological encouragement to Timothy. We see that in 1st and 2nd of Timothy. And he told him to stand strong on the truth in the battle of spiritual warfare. That means the fight against false ministers and other spiritual warfare as well. Uh, he also sent instruction on a number of topics such as prayer and watching out for false teachers. We just talked about that. And when I say false teachers, Remember, a teacher is a minister, so I'm talking about false ministers. Say to yourself, false ministers. So now I'm going to tell you about how to find and recognize a false minister. Okay, so you'll be able to discern this. Number one is the obvious one. It's the seriousness and the deceitfulness of the error. It'll be staring at you in the face. Number two the size of the audience. Is it growing? A lot of people like to have their ears tickled. A lot of people like to hear that gossip. And so if the size of the audience is growing rapidly, that's a red flag. Uh, number three, the duration of their ministry. 
Did they make one blunder or are they constantly doing it? How long did the ministry last? Is it still going? Does it have a history? Number four, the vulnerability of the people for whom you are responsible. As I said before, people like to have their ears tickled. See how those sheep of the church are being handled. And number five, the role you have in influencing shepherds who really need to be discerning for who the false teachers are. So that's how to find and recognize false ministers. Now, we're going to talk about my 10th topic, which is the importance of character in Christ. The Bible teaches that one of our primary responsibilities to know, love, and follow Jesus to, is to teach the body of Christ to be like Jesus in character. Character development is a lifelong process. You see, the problem is that because of our sinful nature and negative influences, that's the spiritual warfare, uh, the, and the negative influences of the world we live in, if we aren't intentional about teaching character, sadly, it is very easy to raise children of God that look nothing like Jesus. And who is going to want to know about Jesus if we can't demonstrate his character and love to others? If we can't do that, no one will have the interest. So we must be intentional to develop these character traits in our children. So let's talk about our character traits. Let's take a look at true character. And I have, uh, let's see, I think it's a total, well, it's a number of them, so I'll share them with you. Uh, we'll demonstrate godly character yourself. Actions speak louder than words. So part of your ministry is the way you act. Number two, pray for godly characters. This is a good reminder to start every morning asking Jesus to fill us with the fruit of his spirit and to help us to be great examples. Number three, choose one character trait to work on at a time so that you can perfect it. See, character is a big spectrum. Break it up. One of the good ones to start with is the character of integrity. Number four, practice, practice, practice character. See, we're talking about character again. Ask God about certain situations that will come up later in the day and ask how you should respond with the targeted character trait. Ask God how you should behave. Ask God what you should do. Don't make the decision yourself. Number five, reinforce character traits to make them stick. That means positive reinforcements and words of affirmation can go a long way to encourage godly character to stick around. Speak it into existence. Next, I'm going to talk about my 11th topic which is the character of integrity. I, I alluded to that previously. The character of integrity exhibits the obedience and practice of the moral code of ethics, moral values and precepts from God's word. In practice, integrity will produce honor, truth and reliability. It will allow one to keep his or her word and do the best even when no one else is aware. This is essential for deeper relationships and, of course, for developing other people's confidence in you and Christianity. Integrity is considered the very basics and application of character. It is the demonstration of who we are in Christ and that our faith is real and backed up with our attitude and word. The absence of integrity is an indication that we as Christians are perhaps fakes and frauds at worst and ineffective and useless at best. Jesus calls us to integrity, which means we are to be true to our word as a testimony to our faith in him. We are not to be worldly with our words or the veracity of our virtue and character. Everything we do as a child of God must be in integrity, truthfulness, and honesty as we are re representing God who is living in us. So the question is, is the character of integrity working in you? Ask yourself, how do I exhibit, exhibit integrity in my daily life? How can I better develop a willingness to possess more integrity? 
Number three, what blocks integrity from working and being exhibited in me? Ask yourself that. How can I make integrity function better, stronger, and faster, even in times of uncertainty and stress? And in my 12th topic, we're in this together. You see, if you're at the Resurrection Center, you will see at the altar the words, worship the king. We all say worship the king and say amen. I like to use acronyms. In a previous presentation, two weeks ago, I had talked about this. King, keep in need of God. And what is God? Good orderly direction. Amen. A-M-E-N, almighty eternal name. Now, my last topic, or second to last topic, I should say, is we need to be big and fat. And, and yes, I agree, this is nuts. This is nuts. We need to be big and fat in our walk with Christ. What do I mean by that? Big, it means believing in God. Fat, you need to have faith. You need to be available. And you need to be teachable. You need to accept the teachings that a minister provides you. And what do I mean by it's nuts? Never underestimate the spirit. Never underestimate the spirit. So for all of us, Let's talk about what it means to be a disciple. And I'll use the acronym for disciple, D-I-S-C-I-P-L-E, disciple. Determination, intercession, pray for others. Servant, serve others in your community. Commitment to the word. Integrity, we've talked about integrity. Perseverance, that means don't give up, don't backslide. Love. That's the language of God, let our voices encourage. Another acronym, L-O-V-E, love, let our voices encourage. What does that mean? It's an action. And the last one is evangelism. Share the gospel. Let people know what you believe in. So let me give a, a summary. What have we talked about today? Uh, we talked about a lot of things today. Uh, number one, what being a Christian means. Number two, what do we mean by ministers? Number three, we talked about teachings and principles and what that is all about. Number four, we talked about pastoral epistles. Number five, how is a church leadership organized? Uh, number six, understanding 1 Timothy chapter three. Number seven, actions from behaviors. Number eight, responsibilities of a church party. Number nine, how to recognize a false minister. Number 10, the importance of character in Christ. Number 11, character of integrity. Number 12, we are in this together. Number 13, we need to be big and fat. And yes, this is nuts. And then we talked about being a disciple. Today's topic is spiritual house cleaning. My name is David Ewan of the Bravehearted Ministry from the Resurrection Center with pastors Jose and Melly Martinez. Join us on our website, www.resurrectionspringfield.org. My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center.